I watched a movie this week. It wasn't a very good movie. Mostly it was hard to watch. You may have heard of it, Cannibal Holocaust. Hey, I'm Neoma Finn. When I first heard of the movie Cannibal Holocaust, I have to admit I was intrigued. There's quite a legend behind that film, and I'll get to that in a minute. Suffice it to say, it'll blow your mind. My husband was the one who first told me about it. He's always on the lookout for a new and interesting topic for my videos. God love him. In my need to be as thorough as possible, I insisted on watching the movie before I wrote a single word about the story behind it, and he let me. God love him. By the way, God love him? That's Yankee speak for bless his heart. To give you a little background on the film, it was shot in 1979 and released in 1980 by Italian film director Ruggiero Diodato. When it first came out, it was considered, and still is, one of the most shocking movies ever made. The premise of the film is that an American documentary film crew has disappeared in the Amazonian jungle, otherwise known as the Green Inferno, and presumed dead. One man, Professor Harold Monroe, is sent to try and find them, or at least discover what happened to them. Five minutes into the movie, I already knew I didn't care what happened to those four people. They were all jerks. Two more minutes in, and I don't think I even cared what happened to the good professor and his guides. Even after I got the full money on two of them, I was still, eh. Robert Kerman, who played Professor Monroe, was better known for his career in the adult film industry, so I shouldn't have been shocked when he disrobed for the camera. I shouldn't have been, but I was. Professor Monroe makes his way into the jungle and eventually discovers the tribe who had the film crew for supper. Because he's an anthropologist, he manages what the film crew failed. He befriends the tribe, so much so that they invite him for dinner as well. Not to be dinner, but to dine on... Well, you get the picture. We next find ourselves in New York, where Professor Monroe is asked to narrate the documentary being made from the found footage he brought back with him. It was pretty much all that was left of the film crew. Mortified, he sets out to prove to the film company all the reasons why this documentary should never be made. In the process, we get to watch all the found footage. Here's a side note for you. This film inspired the entire found footage genre. So if you like found footage movies as much as I like them, you'll hear the sarcasm in my voice when I say, Thank you, Rogero Diodato. Thank you very much. That reminds me of a story. I know how you all love these, so I'll try not to drag it out too long. Back in 1999, my older son was working at the local movie theater. One day, he came in with his friends, and they were all talking about the new movie that had just come out and how interesting it was and how creepy, and so on. Knowing that few people love a good scary movie more than I do, they all insisted I go see it. The whole movie is made up of film footage that was discovered in the woods after some college students disappeared, they told me. Really? I said. Yeah, they found the film and turned it into a movie, they told me. Uh-huh, I said. One thing led to another, and my son handed over his free pass, one of the perks of being an usher at the local cinema, and that Saturday afternoon, the hottest day of the summer, I went to see The Blair Witch Project. The theater was virtually empty that day. I had my pick of seats. I chose one as far from the three teenagers at the front as I could get. Shortly after I sat down, an elderly couple came in. I'm a people watcher. I observe appearance, behavior, and body language, and then I try to apply what I've observed to a life I create for them. Several things struck me about that couple. The first thing that I noticed about them was the fact that the man was a full foot shorter than the woman. I'm only five feet four inches tall. Most men are taller than me. That's probably a good thing because I don't think I'd be comfortable dating a man who's shorter than me. This older gentleman was probably my height. Furthermore, I doubt he weighed much more than 100 pounds. Age had relaxed his skin to the point of hanging off his frame and it added a pronounced stoop to his posture. Together, it gave him the appearance of an emaciated orangutan. 
I had to admire his fedora, though. I've always loved men in hats. It's a shame more men don't wear them. The woman was as exceedingly tall as the man was short. She, too, had the appearance of leather draped over a sawhorse. She was wearing enough makeup to paint a large room, had a ring on every finger, and not small rings, mind you. These things were made of wide bands and fitted with large stones. Her hair was overly teased and dyed a harsh black, which did nothing to soften the wrinkles that were already amplified by the excessive use of makeup. The earrings she wore pulled her earlobes down so that they looked like the ears of a basset hound, and that perfectly complemented her drooping lower eyelids, and if she was wearing one gold chain, she was wearing twenty. But what fascinated me most about the woman was the fact that she was wearing, on the hottest day of summer, mind you, a fur coat. Well, she wasn't actually wearing it. It was draped around her shoulders like a cape. My God, I whispered to the empty seat next to me. She's got to be dying of heat exhaustion. You know, that's right, it whispered back. I sat in silence through the next century or so while three highly unlikable college students managed to get themselves lost in a patch of woods the size of my backyard, irritate each other to the point of contemplating murder, and blow snot bubbles at close range into a handheld camera. The whole time, all I could think was, why on earth would my son and his friends think this movie was real? I knew these kids. They're not that stupid. Obviously, if this footage had been found, then it would be considered evidence in the ongoing investigation of where, oh, where have the three idiots gone? I came to the conclusion that my kids were playing a joke on me. It wasn't funny, especially that night when I actually had nightmares about that stupid movie. At long last, Mikey found his way to the corner of the cellar and Heather dropped the camera, presumably knocked out cold by an audience member from the film's premiere. The lights came up and the elderly couple who had chosen to seat themselves a mere three rows in front of me stood up. The woman turned around, looked up toward the projection booth and said, That's it? That's all there is? I don't get it. You can understand, I'm sure, how I, someone who was born without filters, tact, or the good sense God gave a mule, then proceeded to laugh hysterically in that poor woman's overdone face. And this week, I learned that I have Ruggiero Deodato to thank for inspiring that film. Oh, where to begin? Well, I've already expressed how much I truly did not enjoy Cannibal Holocaust. The only likable characters in the whole movie had a fondness for human flesh, and frankly, that fact didn't win the many brownie points in my book. Then there's the background behind the film, and let's face it, that's what the story's all about. In three separate scenes in that movie, animals are killed for food. I'm not a vegetarian, so don't get me wrong when I say I didn't like those scenes. It wasn't the idea of the animals having to die so that humans could eat. Go ahead, take my T-bone steak away from me. See how that works out for you. The animals in this film, however, actually had to sacrifice their lives for the benefit of art. And I use the word art loosely here. That's right, the muskrat, the turtle, and the monkey all actually died on camera so we could watch a movie. Huh, I just realized. The muskrat, the turtle, and the monkey sounds like a 60s rock group, or three separate rock groups. Furthermore, the monkey scene required two takes, so two monkeys died for the benefit of the film. I'm guessing their names were Davy and Peter. Oh, and I forgot one. A pig was shot at close range, on screen. So four animals, not three. Huh, the animals. Another 60s rock group. As if this wasn't all bad enough, things took a rather strange turn when word got out that Cannibal Holocaust was actually a snuff film. In other words, it wasn't just the animals that lost their lives in the making of the movie. The four actors who played the members of the missing documentary film crew, they said, had actually been killed. On screen, like the animals. I'm hearing we got to get out of this place in my head. Ten days after its premiere in Milan, Italy, the film was confiscated and director Ruggiero Deodato was arrested on suspicion of homicide. Personally, that's a charge I think should have stuck. After all, found footage films have gone a long way towards killing the film industry. The fact that the four actors, Perry Perkinen, Francesca Ciardi, 
Carl Gabriel York, and Luca Barbaresci were nowhere to be found was all the proof they needed. Deodato had these promising young actors killed. Okay, that's a lie. There was nothing promising about these actors. The world was abuzz. People who had never heard the phrase snuff film were suddenly seeing it blazoned across the headlines of international newspapers. The title Cannibal Holocaust was well known, even if its movie wasn't. You see, it was at the police station sitting in the evidence locker, which, I might add, is where the film footage from the Blair Witch Project would have been if it had been real. It's like when people watched The Sixth Sense, saw Bruce Willis's character die in the first five minutes of the movie, then spent the rest of it following a kid around who talks to dead people and who talks to Bruce Willis. And then they're shocked at the end of the movie that Bruce Willis's character was dead all along? Common sense. A little common sense, please. I'm not bitter. A little angry. But I'm not bitter. Except, in the case of Cannibal Holocaust, the movie really was sitting in an evidence locker. And Ruggiero Deodato really was being held on suspicion of murder. The big question on everybody's mind was, where are the four actors? Imagine going to see a movie that has already left you mildly scarred for life and then realizing you've actually watched four people being brutally... I can't finish that description. The good folks at YouTube will all have heart attacks and then I'll be thrown in jail on suspicion of murder. Let's just say the last 10 minutes of the found footage portion of the movie was a bit hard to watch. In all fairness to Deodato, he was no stranger to controversy. In 1966, he made the movie Django. No, Jamie Foxx was not in this one. He wasn't even born yet. Django held the reputation for being one of the most violent movies ever made, so much so that it was refused a certificate in the United Kingdom until 1993. But this was the first time he was arrested for a movie he made. Just so you know, Ruggiero Deodato passed away a few weeks ago. And perhaps that's why Cannibal Holocaust has suddenly come back to prominence. So where were the four actors? Well, they weren't dead. When they made the movie, they all signed a contract to disappear for a while. The whole thing was a publicity stunt gone awry. In the end, Perkin and Chiardi, York and Barbaresci all had to break their contract and make an appearance on a television show together to prove Deodato's innocence. Only then were the Italian police satisfied. (sighs) I've done my best to make sense of this film. Admittedly, the special effects, more like camera tricks than makeup and prosthetics, during the scenes involving the demise of the film crew, were much better than those used in other gruesome scenes. The only scenes that really did look more realistic were those during which real animals really lost their lives. So I kind of understand how the officials might have been fooled by such an over-the-top stunt. Concerning those poor animals, I tried to find symbolism in their deaths. They might have been meant to represent the four members of the film crew. The muskrat and Jack bore a mild resemblance to each other. Mark was as slow as a turtle at times. Faye was certainly as deceptively cute as a monkey and inwardly just as vicious. And there can be no doubt that Jack was a pig but I think that would be giving too much credence to a truly horrible movie. In the end, it wasn't the supposed deaths of the actors that left its mark on the world. It was the gratuitous deaths of the four, actually five, innocent animals that kept the film from being released in a lot of markets. To this day, that is the most talked about part of the movie. Deodato didn't have to stage any sort of publicity stunt. He'd unwittingly created one, by his own callous disregard for those creatures who were helpless to defend themselves. I wasted four bucks on this movie. It's an hour and a half of my life, much like that hot summer afternoon in August of 1999, and again, I'm not bitter, that I wasted in a movie theater watching The Blair Witch Project and that I will never get back. Images from Cannibal Holocaust are burned into my mind, both real and created through special effects. If you ask me, I'd say don't waste your time. But that decision's up to you. After all, cannibalism really is a matter of taste. I'm Neoma Finn.